Hey everyone and welcome to 121 in Flux, I am Peter, that is Connor and we talk about movies on this show but this episode's a little bit different from normal because normally we pick a movie, we watch it and we talk about it, that's you know, simple, it's like a book club but for movies. So it's better. <laughs> oh that just made me think, did you ever see that show Flash Forward? That horrible lost knockoff that happened like maybe 10 years I ago? I remember it but i never watched i think maybe i watched one episode i remember yeah, what it was though it, it wasn't very good but there was a really bad line of dialogue i, I got to like maybe four or five episodes there was a really bad line of dialogue about four episodes in and it was like a, a group of people that had like a suicide pact and the the fbi guy who was like the main character i just i, I made myself think of it there because what i just said he had a line of dialogue that stuck with me to this day that's terrible because it's like a book club but with bullets <laughs> That is the best line ever. And it stuck with me. So when I said there... How does that work? (laughs) How... how, Like... It's obviously only one meeting. (laughs) Yeah. You can't meet multiple times. Is it, alright, we'll all get together, we'll all read the book, or in this case, we'll all get together, we'll all shoot each other. Yes. Uh, What? Um, What? So I, I, you know, I just said uh, it's like a, it's a book club with movies, and I just, that, I got a flashback (laughs) to flash forward. Um... (laughs) Ter- terrible terrible show but uh yeah so th- what this is this is a countdown every so often every three or four months we do a countdown episode and what this means is over two parts we do a top 50 this is going to be our top 50 movies of the 1980s uh so it's a top 50 of a decade uh i have assembled my top 50 connor's assembled his top 50 and the way this works is very simple connor will give his number 50 i'll give my number 50 he'll do his 49 and so on and so forth and we'll alternate this first part is going to be numbers 50 through 26 and you'll get the second part uh, next week so that's what's going to happen uh simple as simple as can be oh yeah all right we'll get going <laughs> we will we will i don't know I was, first. I was expecting a witty comment or something but you know you, you're disappointed i'm saving my energy for giving you shit when you have a stupid pick or more likely defending mine when you you raise hell <laughs> i like that you put it as raising hell but yeah um yeah yeah we'll start with yours number 50 number 50 what uh, is it so number 50 i have a uh, clash of the titans uh this uh, i watched this last year some, sometime um it kind of surprised me how well it, it kind of held up it, it, it went in a lot quicker than i say it was uh, I, re- I remember talking to you afterwards uh when we talked about on the on the movie news that, that i'd watched it and uh I checked the runtime. It was a lot longer than I thought it was after watching it. Uh, it had gone in so quickly, and uh, all the the stop motion miniature work with all the, the monsters is absolutely stellar, uh, and, and it is worth watching for that alone. Frankly, never seen it, so I can't. Call yeah, it. not your sort of film. I, yeah. I, I I can't imagine you'd get much out of it. But if, if you're into that sort of thing, I think it's pretty good. I did see the the uh, 2010 version. This is much better. <laughs> yeah, do, it has do, to do, be. Do, do not judge it on that, please. It has to be. It can get worse than the 2010 version. I don't know how it could get worse. It did. It yeah, did get worse. It Wrath of the Titans. Called Wrath of the Titans. <laughs> <laughs> um, never saw Wrath. I'm happy to say, uh, Clash was enough to make me run for the for the for the hills. So that's okay. All right, my number fifty then is Adventures in Babysitting. Hmm. Are you familiar with this one? Uh, I, I've I've never seen it, but I'm familiar with what it is. Yeah, this is so much of my list is going to be stuff that I grew up with. Not all of it, but a lot of it is. This is actually not exactly. This sounds like it is, but it's not. This is one that I saw for the first time maybe like five years ago. It's interesting. And but basically, it felt like something I should have grown up with. Like I watched it, and as I was watching, I'm like this is something I should have been watching as a kid. Like th- this feels like something that I should have been into my whole life. Um. Uh, you've got you've got um, Elizabeth Shue, obviously, who was a was a big actress in the eighties for these types of movies, um, and it was shown up. At, I don't know if she's shown up in recently, but I remember her popping up as an adult in Hollow Man. But even that was like twenty years ago. Now, my God, Hollow Man's like nineteen years old. Shit. <laughs> but you know, um, you're an old man. Well, I wasn't born when this was made, at least, so I'm not that old. Hmm. Yeah, you'll, you'll have been born when some of the things on this list will have been made. A very small fraction. Yes, but that's more than me. There's only seven months of the 80s that I was born during, so you know what? I'm not going to get too upset about this. S- seven months more than I was. Shut your face. Shut your ginger face. Um, 
so yeah, this is a movie uh, where the, the, the babysitter, uh, Elizabeth Shue, and the kids go on kind of an adventure. Uh, they end up having to get into the city, and there's a lot of really fun running jokes. The, the, the little sister girl, uh, she she loves Thor, and she's got like a Thor helmet on the entire time, and she wants to find Thor, and they eventually run into this like surfer dude with long blonde hair, and she's convinced it's Thor. And it's just, and it's one of these things where if I saw this as a kid, this might have been my exposure to what Thor was, because I didn't know what who Thor was as a kid. Yeah, who did? Yeah, well, Marvel fans. <laughs> yeah, they don't count. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't into Marvel as a kid, so I mean, obviously this is what the kid likes. She's talking about Thor from the comics. She's not talking about Thor the Norse, you know, mythology. Yeah. She's talking about Thor, the Marvel character. Um, but it was, it was, you know, it was fun, and it's one of those delightful hijinks '80s movies where the they have to go on a bit of a weird, wacky adventure. Mm. Um, and you know, it's the reluctant hero teenager who just wants to go on dates with the boyfriend, <laughs> but she gets roped into this. Um. And by the end, she bonds with the kids, and it's a, it's a delightful story. I It was funny, it was charming, and if you like these types of movies from the 80s, um, I, th- I think you'll enjoy it. So, Adventures in Babysitting. What's your thought, 49? Just to, uh, to go off oh. something you mentioned there, how yours is a lot of what you grew up with. I thought, you know what, I'm going to have a look at my list, because in theory it should be. Yeah. But it's surprisingly not. There's a, there's just, there's a handful that, that are that, don't get me wrong. I think I'll point them out as I go which ones weren't. That, that, that one wasn't, surprisingly. But yeah. um, I'll point um, out which ones were, were not childhood growing uh, up movies. I, I will say my number 49 is one of those. Okay. And you're going to give me shit. Because uh, it's Batman. Uh, yeah, yeah, there we go. I like this movie. I have fun with this movie. It's stylish. And... I get enjoyment watching it. What more do you want? And don't give me any of this bollocks about a good Batman movie. <laughs> I can see it on your face. What What an unreasonable request. What do you want from a Batman movie? Oh, I'd like a good Batman movie, please. Do you know what? I would too, but I've had some of those now. <laughs> so I'm quite happy with having just a Tim Burton movie here that I quite enjoy. Oh, ne- ne- never be happy with a Tim Burton movie. Never. <laughs> or actually, to, to, we're talking about Batman. I should be saying... Never. You should, yeah. yes. Um, and my terrible Michael Caine impression. <laughs> Although, it's shockingly easy to do it when it's just one word, and I just do it that way <laughs> every time. <laughs> I don't have to think yeah. about it, just never. Um, all right, my number 49 is actually, again, the second movie that's not a childhood movie. Um, I promise there's a lot coming. There's a reason why these are lower down the list. Uh, but number 49 is one that you have seen, for sure, because we watched it together at one point. It is Chopping Mall. This is much lower for you than I'd have expected. Well, you know, I mean, it, it, it was relatively high in the 80s horror list, but obviously we're mixing in all the other genres, um, mm. so that the horror becomes more spread out. Um, and the reason why I know that is because me and Tim did top uh, horror movies of the 80s uh, back in October, or actually not, we start in November, we did that. Uh, so you can check that out in the Countdowns playlist if you want to find it easily on the YouTubes. Uh, or if you're on the audio feeds, go to the Screams After Midnight and just scroll down a little bit <laughs> and you'll find it. Um... So, Chopping Mall is just a ridiculously great B-movie. It is everything I love about cheesy B-movies from the 80s. It's yeah. set in a mall, there's killer robots, there's cheesy lines, there's, uh, you know, archetype characters that are... Great score. Silly. There's a great, yeah, great ridiculous score. Um, one of the best head explosions in low-budget cinema. <laughs> uh, it definitely is up there. Dick Miller has a cameo. It's a whole thing. It's a whole. It's, a, it's just delightful. It it knows what it is. It's got a sense of humor, and I actually liked how playful it gets with some of its set pieces towards the end. But there's like, it, there's, it, no, it it knows what it is, yeah. doesn't it? But you know, there's like a scene where there's a character hiding in a pet store, and there's a lot of fun stuff with the pets, like getting in the way and stuff like that. It's just you know, it's, it's stuff. And there's great lines. There's, just to quote one of my favorite lines of dialogue from this movie. Uh, a character asks not because they go to the gun store in the mall to get guns, even though they're robots. What the guns going to do? Because um, it does, it, they accomplish nothing with it um, outside of sh- shooting a can of gasoline at one point, which is fair enough. That was useful in that one. I just did this, but everything else, not so much. Um, you know, Makes car- you feel better. A character says to the other one, "You know, do you know how to use that thing?" And he goes, "I've seen Dirty Harry twenty four times," and then <laughs> takes his shot. It was yeah, so. That, that's yeah. the movie. That's 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 Chopping Mall. What's your 48? <laughs> uh, my 48 is Hellraiser. Ah. Yeah, so um, 
pro- I, I don't know if I've actually got a lot of horror movies on this list, thinking about it. Um, but, I mean, there's probably a handful, but th- this is one for sure. Um, this is one that I know maybe some people would, would think would be a bit higher. Um, uh, it's. I thought, well, what's this? Because I watched it a couple of years ago, and I mm. thought, yeah, that was all right. And then I watched it again the following year, and I enjoyed it a lot more. Once I uh, once I'd got rid of those expectations, I think. I I don't think Hellraiser is a movie that anyone like who's not seen it knows exactly what to expect from it. it, it yeah, it's a very specific story um, about you know this this awful person and this awful woman who are luring people in to try and like you know bring this guy back to life because he's like a yeah you know and <laughs> once I, once I kind of knew okay that's what I'm getting into yeah I was a lot more into it. <laughs> Yeah, the Cenobites aren't actually the stars of the films. They're they're a small plot point essentially. Yeah, uh, great the, design. The, great, yeah, great presence. Yeah, very good. Uh, also, the box you opened it, we came. Great voice. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I don't know how good my impression actually is, but I love doing it. So he he got it. Um, but yeah, no, the is great. Uh, my number forty eight is the Breakfast Club. Okay. Which you might be altering what you just said about your pick. You may be thinking that's a bit low. Why is the Breakfast Club down here? Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, not to spoil anything, but that shows up on my list quite a bit later on. <laughs> no, I like the Breakfast Club a lot. This is actually, again, one that I, Well, this is borderline. I saw this in high school. I mean, it's young enough. It's not as a kid, but it's in yeah. your formative years. Do you know what's funny about it, though? Is I feel like I'm at the point now where high school is more the middle of my life. Whereas, you know, there was a time when that, was, that felt late enough that I didn't really count it as being a kid, but it, it kind of is, isn't it? Yeah, it's, see, it's not watching as a kid, but I feel like it has just as much, if not more, impact yeah. on your overall tastes. I guess the reason why I don't think of it in the same way that some of the other stuff that I grew up on is I remember when I watched it for the first time when I was you know, 15, 16, I remember one of the things I liked about it was, oh, this is an 80s movie I've not seen. I like 80s movies. It's, you know, I already had nostalgia for 80s movies by the time I watched this. <laughs> Yeah, I think part of the difference as well is a lot of the ones that you watch, you know, when you're a kid is something you said there, you remembered when you first watched it. That's true. Yeah, that's another and difference. a lot of the other ones that, okay, when you're a kid, you can't tell you, you know, you can't point out the first time you watched that. It's just kind of always been so, there with a lot of those movies, right? This one's borderline. I can guarantee you the next one is definitely childhood. But we're diving into childhood territory over the next two or three. That's interesting. But um, yeah, uh, Breakfast Club is i love a bottle story you know what i do and yeah. this, this is a bottle movie it's all set in the high school in a particularly high tech uh for the time library oh, well high tech's not the right word it's, it's not high tech but it's very fancy it looks very swish yeah. it's a very modern looking library it's bright lights it looks very uh artistic and like someone designed, designed the show with this library to the point where it's almost not believable that it's a high school library yeah <laughs> um almost like the hit television show buffer the vampire Slayer. you know what as soon as soon as you start going about stylish libraries, it's like it's about to bloody do it. I mean, Buffy's library is get more doesn't look as uh, like modern. It's not modern, but, but it's, it has it's a stylish way too design. Stylish for a yeah. school. Yeah, it does. Um, that's this one looks more like an actual library, I suppose, in that sense. But it still looks a bit too fancy. But yeah. regardless, it's you know it's a bunch of kids detention on Saturday, and it's there's this coming of age story of them all sort of admitting what what the problems are and, and growing up a little bit over one day um and it's just you know it's just i, I like stories like this I, I like stories where it is like not quite real time because obviously it takes place over like six seven hours as opposed to the, the yeah. 90 minutes or whatever but it's, it is. it's over a day yeah uh but i like movies like this uh, when they're well done when they're when they're written in a way where i can see the emotional journey over the the course of the the movie despite the fact that you know it's not like oh big act one big act two oh, at the end of act two people are dying act three we have to save the world uh, like those no, are great. none of that don't get me wrong those are great but I like these more personal stories. Um, there's a couple of elements that have dated a bit, of course, since the 80s, but you, you look at it for what it is and you take those elements out and you, yeah, you get uh, into it. I feel like that's something that is always going to happen with a lot of cinema. Um, Absolutely. I think this one sticks out a little bit in some places just because of the t- story that is and what it's dealing with, the fact that it has these like casual little sexist things in there or things like that. They, yeah. just, they stick out a bit more because it feels like it, it goes against what the story's doing. No, no, that's true. Yeah. Uh, whereas when it happens in like Adventures in Babysitting like a little bit, I don't know if it does, I can't remember, <laughs> but like if it does... It probably does because, yeah. again, of its time, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Breakfast Club, what's your 47? 
Uh, 47 is one that we covered on uh, in Flux quite a while back. Oh. Uh, this is uh, Dune. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, flawed, but kind of very enjoyable. If... And has some <laughs> masterpiece scenes. Do you know what? I'm going to be honest here. I kind of didn't consider putting this on my list. And I liked it more than you did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah. I mean, because I, I have a lot less of, oh, these nostalgic... Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't get a lot of nostalgia things in general. Uh, it doesn't do all that much for me a lot of the time. Yeah, this could just be a case of I've seen more movies from the 80s than you have. Be, I, see, that's the thing as, as well. Like, a lot of the ones that I saw in my childhood quite a lot and enjoyed a lot of the time. I've not really seen a lot mm. since, so I kind of didn't even think about those. I was just like, do you know what? No, I don't want that on the list. I'm, I'm not confident that I would still support that opinion. I feel um, like... I don't think there's anything on my list that I've not seen since I was a kid. I think everything's... I've seen at least once as an adult, too. Well, that's fair, but even to like when it. I say... You know, there's things that I've seen, like, okay, well, maybe I saw it when I was 15. Hmm. But... Um, yeah, you know, it was it was long enough ago now that I'm like, do you know what? I don't want to say that it holds up to where I want it on this list now. Mm. Yeah, but do, do um, Yeah, so you know, worm riding. Yeah, worm riding, bombastic score, great visuals. Yeah, yeah well, well, you know, have fun with it. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. My number forty-seven. Uh, I promised a childhood one. This definitely falls into that category. This is Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Uh, Robert Zemeckis directing. Uh, this is your live action mixed with two D animation in a world where cartoon characters are real people and actors and their things. <laughs> yeah, this this is an an example of one that you know. Yeah, so as a kid, I mm. you know, enjoyed it, but didn't even consider for my list because I'm like, you know, I haven't seen it recently enough to to really consider. It's very pulpy. It's it's surprisingly menacing. Christopher Lloyd's villain is very good. Um. It's got a lot of really witty jokes. Bob Hoskins is great. And then, of course, you have all the cameos from all the cartoon characters. It has, you know, both Disney and Warner Brothers characters. You know, it, it kind of brought everything together because it was this once-in-a-lifetime thing. And so far, it kind of has been once-in-a-lifetime. There's not really been... The closest thing to this is Space Jam, which is, you know, a different ballpark. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's it's, just, it's it's very strong um, and gets a lot of love. Um, Jessica Rabbit is probably loved a bit too much by certain people on the internet but yeah well that's the internet for you that's what it is yeah um but yeah 47 who free roger rabbit what's your 46 uh my 46 is the adventures of buckaroo banzai across the eighth dimension which is a far too long a title oh, it's, it's a perfect length i've had this in blu-ray for like four years and i've still not watched it. <laughs> have you not <laughs> it's you know, I think it's it's notable that it's on the lower end of this list, given the the yeah. premise of, you know, this this character who's like a, a you know a physicist test pilot rock star, fighting interdimensional aliens. That sounds like it should be higher on this list, and it, it kind of falls short at, at, at points. It's a bit over long, but it's still really fun. Uh, I, had a, I had a blast with it with it, so you know, I'll get to it at some point. I'll get yeah, to it. Yeah, well, I'm sure we'll do it eventually. That's when I'll get to it. The chances of me putting it on randomly are pretty slim, but eventually we'll say, oh, we'll do it with that because I've got it and not watched it yet. Yeah, I've still, you know, I've got the Blu ray lying around, so, you know, whenever. Uh, my number 46 is actually a Christmas film. It's Scrooged, uh, the Bill Murray Scrooged. Um, this is actually one that I saw as a kid, and I don't think I actually liked it that much as a kid, but I, watching it as an adult, when, because it, it's more of an adult's comedy, it's not, it's not really a kid's comedy. Yeah. Uh, by any means. Uh, and it's phenomenal. Bill Murray is fantastic in this. This is this is definitely my favourite version of the Christmas Carol. Uh it, it just it just is. Um but no, I actually I like watching this one on Christmas Eve because it kinda counts down to Christmas to Christmas on Christmas Eve almost. Because it kinda one of the big things at the end is it's like a midnight telecast as, as it hits Christmas and um I don't know, it just it feels very festive. Bill Murray's really funny, um it's got this dark sense of humour. Uh, he's a proper dick. Like I think that's what I like about it is that obviously you usually have Scrooge as this, you know, it's an old timey story yeah. and he's this awful person. This makes him an awful eighties businessman, and that, that it's very that, easy to translate, isn't it? Yeah, and that makes it a very kind of easy to get into interpretation because it's a, just a normal thing. Um, it, you know, because you, you could do this again now and do it with a, you know, a current businessman, I suppose. It was like Elon Musk. 
Yeah, you could do it that, oh, that way. Um, but it wouldn't be Bill Murray anymore, and Bill Murray's a big part of why this is glorious. So, um, yeah, fair enough. Uh, no, also, this one didn't do that much for me, but no, I like it a lot. Um, fair enough. What's your forty-five? Uh, my forty-five is a uh, Grave of the Fireflies. This is a uh, Studio Ghibli. Um, it's about two kids during uh, World War Two who get separated from their parents, and it's kind of just them trying to survive. It's an uplifting uh, tale. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 depressing as shit, but it's <laughs> gorgeous. The animation is stunning. Uh, it's it's a very emotional story. Um, it's excellent. It's um, it's, it's you know, uh, have you seen this? I did. I don't remember a whole lot of it though. Oh yeah, fair enough. Uh, no, I I think the the animation uh, elevates it uh, for me um, because it's just the the way uh, it plays some of the emotional moments uh, really works. Um, number 45 is an old childhood one that I grew up with um, saw a lot as a kid and that is the original Karate Kid um, staple of the 80s for many a reason um, lots of the shoes in this one again actually is the girlfriend um, but you know very quotable everyone quotes on wax on wax off sweep the leg all these things uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sports movie at it's heart in the sense that it builds up to a tournament and it's you know uh, Daniel doing his thing. People like to pick it apart now and talk about how Daniel's actually kind of a dick. Um, which is probably true for a lot of 80s movies if you really stop and think about the characters. Um, yeah. Character writing maybe was <laughs> at its best at the time. Uh, but it has a lot going for it. It has a charm. It's, you know, it's a much longer movie than I think uh, you'd expect yeah, it to be. We looked at doing it again before the, the, show. the, the YouTube yeah. show hit. And it was, it was over two hours, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like two hours, 15 minutes. Which I was like, whoa, really? I was expecting like an hour 40. And it was like two hours, yeah. 15. I'm like, jeez. The Karate Kick saga. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But no, it, it, it's what I remember having an interest in martial arts as a kid, mostly based on this movie. Uh, I'm sure you weren't alone. Yeah. And I, I think it was, and actually, I, I believe that uh, karate classes like, like spiked. I have a right question. after this came out. On top of this, how much did Power Rangers have an influence on that yeah, interest? Yeah, that's, that's probably also accurate. Um, so, no, it's, 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 a, it's a good movie. Plus, there's some fun stuff early on. I always like the Halloween costume stuff early on. He's got like a shower costume and uh, mm. the bad guys are all dressed as skeletons and Mr. Miyagi comes out and kicks the crap out. Yeah, it's all right. Isn't it? You know, this old man comes out and beats up a bunch of kids. Uh, it's delightful. Yeah, I can get behind that. <laughs> That's the old man I want to be beating up children. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, that's forty five. What's your forty four? Uh, so my forty four is Blade Runner, ah. which is one that I go back and forth on how much I like every time I watch it. <laughs> you know, if I'm in the mood for it, I think I really like it a lot more. Mm. Which is why it's it's definitely on the low end of this list. And I think the the direction's really quite good. The music is phenomenal, which is enough to pull it up. Um, but it's it's kind of weird in that it always on some level disappoints me. Yeah, the, the plot is very meandering. I, do you know, I'm the same. Every time I watch this, I go back and forth. There's, there's been times when I've watched this movie and I come out of it going, oh, that was like an 8.5 or maybe even a 9. Like, you know, I come out really yeah. enthusiastic. And then sometimes I'll watch it and I'll come out going, oh, no, it was, it was, it was, it was, you know, it was really dull. It was six. Uh, like, and... Right now, the last time you watched it was before 2049 came out, and that was one where I came out of it feeling quite down. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, me too. So that's where um, I am right now. I'm at a point with Blade Runner where I'm not that enthusiastic about it, but... No, I agree. If, if you'd asked me, you know, a year and a half ago, this would have been higher. Yes. But that pulled it down, but it's still like, I know, I've had enough enjoyment out of it at times where I've gone, no, that was fantastic, where I'm like, no, no, this should be on my list somewhere. But definitely near the bottom. This, this is very unique. I, I can't think of another movie where I keep watching it and every time I change my opinion back and forth. Yeah, not to this extent. I might, you know, tweak it a bit, but this is quite drastic in, in how I can feel. Yeah, but as you said, music and uh, the, the visuals, all that stuff's great. Yeah. Um, my number 44 is, is, we're back to one that I didn't watch as a kid. I saw this as an adult. Uh, this is Starman. This is John Carpenter's film uh, starring Jeff Bridges and uh, christy allen i believe uh so this is and i, I joked actually because i saw this maybe a, a few years before uh guardians of the galaxy came out and i i remember joking when that movie was coming out that 
Star Lord's backstory, like this is essentially a prequel <laughs> that could lead up to his backstory. Because Jeff Bridges plays a an alien who who comes to Earth, and he takes the form of a, a man who's dead because he sees a photo and he takes the form of this man, and essentially uh, the this man had died you know fairly young and his wife uh, is shocked to see him but then ultimately it ends up helping him on a road trip he has to get to a certain place to to get picked up to go home and it's a road trip movie and it's this love story where they kind of you know bond and fall for each other and she's kind of conflicted because it looks like her husband but it's this whole thing um phenomenal score it is a very notable main theme uh if i, I remember we did easy a on on overload, overload wasn't it? yeah this past year and there was a rap song in the middle of the movie and it kicked into the main theme from starman and i went is that starman music and i looked it up yeah it was like it took samples from that score and the song and i was it's like a, such a strange choice i know i was like man that, what, what a weird and specific pick but uh really good score uh, john carpenter's music uh, i usually like um it's definitely a sweeter story from john carpenter it's not like a dark horror or thriller or anything like that um it's a it's a bit of more of a more of a road trip adventure that's a love story uh there, there are some like government stooges like chasing after them who want the alien for obvious reasons but um yeah. i think it's delightful that's a delightful little movie um so starman what is your number 43 uh my 43 is uh evil dead ah Which, yes evil dead yes uh you know uh kind of a classic um, um at this point yeah, this one's really murky as to what year it came out. Uh, so I'm happy to accept it. I, I never considered it though because I I think I kind of count it as seventy nine. Fair enough, but I mean, ba- basically, you you can see this be dated as seventy nine, eighty eighty one, or eighty two. I have seen yeah, it classified as the, all four the, of those. The IMDb official yes is eighty one. Okay, I mean I I think so anyway. So yes. that's what I went with clearly when I checked. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fair. Um, it, it was really murky. I think it got a really staggered release over a long time, so it depends right, what, okay. you're, what you're counting it as. But enough, fair enough, fair enough. Evil Dead. Evil Dead, yeah. Uh, so I assume by that you, you didn't put it on your list. No, because I, I, I never thought of it, because I, I I had it marked down in my data yeah. as 79, so I never Out of interest, it. would you have had it somewhere on your list if, if it had been, if you'd considered it as 80s? I might have done. Okay. I might have done. Just uh, just just wondering what your your general opinion on this it may, was. I mean, yeah, it may have been a similar place, maybe a little bit lower. Yeah, kind of on the on the lower end, but yeah. you know, it probably sneaks on, right? Um, it's pretty solid. It's it's maybe a little bit too long, weirdly, uh, given that it's not actually that long a film. But everything that, that that's there is is really quite enjoyable. Um, the direction is really low key but solid. Uh. And all the characters are kind of awful in the best way. I don't know if I'd count the uh, camera flying through the forest on a board as as low key, but <laughs> no, no, no. But most of it, out of, out sure. of, outside of that, you know, like most of the movie. Which is funny because I think of Evil Dead two and three, and it's not low key at all. It's no, no, of... they're flamboyant. Yeah, they're very flamboyant direction. Yeah, but the first one, I think, I think, especially when I say low key, there, I'm thinking in context of the franchise. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, my number 43, uh, speaking of Evil Dead, is E.T. And this is the Spielberg classic from 1982. Uh, the heartwarming, good natured story of boy meets alien and looks after alien. The entire family ends up looking after the alien. Uh, uh, I-, I remember as a really young kid uh, watching the, the final like 15 minutes when they're on their bikes. Yeah. Uh, over and over again, <laughs> I was obsessed with that scene as a kid. It it's one that like, I don't love it as much as a lot of other movies, clearly because it's at forty three. But um, there's there's a special place in my heart for like my my fond memories of this. It's still solid yeah. though. It still it still held, holds up very oh, well. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, it's interesting. You you just said there you watched the scene over and over again as yeah. a kid. I don't think I ever did that. It was always like a, a whole movie or a whole you know episode of a TV show that I would watch on repeat. Yeah, I know there's oh, yeah. definitely stuff I watched on repeat. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah, I, w- I would never do it now. I, I think I, I did watch the whole movie a lot, but when I'd get to the end, I'd be like, "I'll oh, rewind." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think I ever did that with anything though. Um, I remember doing that when I was really young, but yeah. No, you. I get it. You do stupid shit when you're a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, obviously, John Williams' music's very good. Uh, the the practical effects in ET are very good. Uh, it's just a very heartwarming story. Obviously, it was ripped off repeatedly. Uh, looking at you, Mac, and me, 
and you know it's it's just you know it's just a favorite for a reason um i would rank it as high as i think a lot of people would um you know like there's other movies the, the very same year that i would rank higher that got got overlooked at the time because everyone was a, a friendly nice ct story but more than that and i'm, two, I'm <laughs> struggling to think what i because because i can't think of the exact year and what else was in that exact year well actually one of them was blade runner but blade, blade runner tanked the box office that year well yeah yeah but there's another one um and I, I I I will blame E.T. because it made everyone want a happy, friendly alien story as opposed to I, I suspect whatever else. this is, I have it somewhere on my list you as probably, well. No, I think you do. You definitely do. Okay. Uh, what, what is uh, your 42? Uh, my 42... Ah, so this is one that I did grow up with. Um, mm. Just because I haven't mentioned that because it's actually been a while since I've had one. Uh, this is uh, Blues Brothers. Ah, yes. So it's, you know, it, it's it's a road trip on the on the run from the police and hijinks occur lots of them including you know some neo-nazis there's a phenomenal, and Western phenomenal band. car chase in this as well at the end <laughs> yeah um no, I like Blues Brothers a lot. interestingly i did not grow up with this i watched this for the first time you know when i was like 20 or something like that <laughs> like yeah. it, was, it was one that I'd, I'd passed by and it's notable uh that i think having grown up with it you have more of it i've only seen it once i i, I think this is one that will grow on me more the more i see it mm that makes sense because it has it has the layers and all that very funny um, yeah I do, I do like it a lot uh i've also seen blues Brothers 2000 which um people tell me is bad i saw that fairly young though i saw that first i can't remember oh, really? I, can't, I never saw that one yeah i can't remember uh like you know i saw it young enough that i can't really give an opinion on it if it was good or bad no okay do you remember feeling like you enjoyed it at the time I think as a kid I liked it, but I don't know if yeah. that'll... But you like a lot of stupid shit as a yeah. kid. We just established that, yeah. Yes, uh, so I don't, I don't know. My number 42, though, is uh, a film that I did not see as a kid. This is one that I I sought out because I, I was gifted a crappy DVD of a movie when I was maybe about 18, 17, 18, something like that. And I liked it so and much. You thought, this is unacceptable. <laughs> I, I still watched it, but I liked it so much that I sought out a better version, a box set, if you will, of the complete series, um, which leads me to Phantasm 2, uh, which is a great sequel to a phenomenal film. And the first one was from the 70s, though, so it's not appearing on this list. But this one is basically the aliens to Phantasm's alien. Uh, it's more of an action movie. It's a little bit bigger budget. Um, we have a quadruple barrel shotgun at one point. Uh, I'm we, down. <laughs> you've, you've sold me. Because the first film is this this eerie, creepy, small town thing, and it's this, these two brothers investigating... Fan, Phantasm's the Silver Balls, right? Yeah, Silver Balls, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, uh, also, you get the main villain going, you know, long before Kratos was doing it, you know, I associate BOY uh, with Phantasm. <laughs> um, so, Phantasm was, was a fantastic film, and I'd say it's the better of the two now, but... Phantasm 2 takes it and says, no, no, now it's a road trip where, you know, little brother's growing up and they're, 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 they're traveling the country trying to find the other towns where the tall man has went and done this to other towns. And it's, a, it's a hunting movie. They're hunting them. Kind of interesting that we both had road trips at 42. Um, what was, what was your 42? Blues Brothers. Oh, yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, not not even remotely similar movies, yeah, but yeah. just, you know, they both have that common thread. Yeah, it's a little bit cheesy, so it's a little bit fun, it's got a fantastic, because uh, the, the main theme from Phantasm is fantastic, it's a really creepy good good theme, uh, it, it's up there with like Halloween and a couple of the other biggies where you just, you recognise it and go, that's, that's Phantasm. What Phantasm 2 does with it is it, it does like a, like a, an orchestrated up version of it where it sounds epic. <laughs> and it's just it's a delightful like yeah i, I like that they did that i like that they they, they, they jazzed it up as it were um yeah. but not literal jazz obviously uh because that'd be weird uh what is your number 42 or sorry 41 41 it's uh it's funny you just mentioned something there because it's halloween too <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice little uh, little link there um i actually really like halloween too um i i don't understand why people don't I enjoy um, Halloween 2 as well. It's definitely weaker on the first one. Oh, yeah, obviously. Don't get uh, me wrong. Because, but... um, I, I mean, the, the first time I saw this, uh, it was on TV. Well, it was on Halloween, obviously, because they were doing a show in them. And, uh, and it was Halloween 1 through 4. Th yeah. It, th 3 was an odd misstep if you were watching them all for the first time that night. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it was. Weird. I mean, I don't hate it. 
I, I, it's it's a bad Halloween movie, but I don't hate it as a movie. No, I mean, Tim loves Halloween 3. Yeah, okay, that's cool. That's Tim's got some taste. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't know about that. I, I don't, well, I said, it's not it's not a good Halloween movie, but I kind of like it. But it was it was a it was an interesting night, and uh, you know, obviously, none of, none of the others live up to the first one because, well, Halloween, right? This is, this is a masterpiece, ten out yeah, of ten, yeah, classic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But two is the closest out of the next few um, for me. Uh, I think it's I think it's a it's a blast. There's some all the stuff in the hospital. I think is great. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I I like it as a as a sort of early East slasher movie. I think it's, it's it's in the pack. It's an enjoyable movie. Um, yeah. Lor- Laurie's kind of like limping around, just being scared a little bit too much. I think that's fair compared to the first one. But uh, some good kills and some fun. The music's not as good, but it still plays with the theme. It still got a bit more synthy in it. It's, it's... Yeah, even even though it's not as good, the theme's still there. Yeah. So I mean, it's automatically pretty good. Um, there's also this is actually something because me and Tim obviously reviewed all the Halloweens over the last few Octobers, mm. and watching Halloween two again, there's a scene in the middle that I was shocked at how extreme it was. Not not in terms of like how much violence it showed, but how extreme stuff escalated like really randomly. Is there's a scene where they think they see Michael Myers on the road, and they try and shoot him, and then a car runs into him and burns him alive, and then they go, "Oh shit, that was just a guy in a similar mask." Oh well. You're right, that does happen. But he burns alive, and I'm like, can we stop and process the fact that an innocent person just gets shot and burned alive in the, the street? <laughs> can we talk about this? Why would you process this? it when there's, when there's slashing to be had? <laughs> it's just like a really, like, it just escalates quickly, and I'm like, hey, Loomis, maybe you should feel guilty about that. Just a thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, Halloween 2. Halloween is pretty good. Pretty good. Um, I don't know if I agree with everything you just said there, but more on that later. Um... Interesting. My number 41 is a comedy that I actually did grow up with, um, although I don't think I appreciated it until I was older. Uh, the, the humour, I think, was a bit bit more of an adult nature for me <laughs> to appreciate as a kid. Uh, but it is A Fish Called Wanda, which is a John Cleese film uh, with Jamie Lee Curtis. And it's about a heist. He, he plays a... They're, they're in England, and John Cleese is a judge who ends up having a relationship with Jamie Lee Curtis who's part of a, of a heist, like a, a jewel thief team. And... Uh, she's essentially infiltrating them to, to help with their, their, their case because they, they need to try and find out where the, the the diamond ended up or whatever it was. Um, but it is a delightful film. Chris Klein is her brother and he's this over-the-top asshole. Um, he's delightful. It's a very funny movie. It is hilarious. And then you've got uh, the, the brother Otto who's like who's got a, a star and there's a lot of humour that comes from that as well. Um have you heard of this? You're looking kind yeah, of no, no, I, I remember. I remember you mentioned it before, but I've never seen it. Yeah, it's very good. It's, it's very, it's very, very solid movie. Um, uh, I don't have a lot of straight up comedies on my best of lists normally, but this one definitely fights you know, scrapes on there. Yeah, I, I typically don't either, actually. Although uh, the, the, there's there's a couple coming up. You know, mm. I feel like there's more from the eighties than there would be probably most of the decades. Yeah, I never even realised. I could have done a Jim Lee Curtis segue there. To get into that I one. thought that's what you were going to do, and then you didn't. And I yeah, thought, I was no. going to butt in and do it. I thought, you know what, I'll let you have it. And then <laughs> you, you you didn't do it. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I never thought of it for some reason. It's because, do you know what's funny? Despite the fact that this is still in the 80s, so it's not even that long since Halloween 2, she looks like adult Jim Lee Curtis in this, so my mind never associated with her with Laurie Strode. Right, okay. You know, she's got the short hair, she looks like she does yeah. in Trading Places, and she looks like she does in, you know, Halloween H2O, funnily enough, and, you know, True Lies. She, she looks like, you know, you know, she's... Well, hit... Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I get you. Um, I think it's because she did have such a drastic haircut, like, change. No, I, th- I think it's all in the hair. Yeah, because I associate... It's, it's like there was a, just a complete transition from... This is the, the Jim Lee Curtis who played Teenagers, and then she switched immediately to... So now she's in a, like, you know... She's like thirty, and then she's just thirty for you know fifteen, twenty years. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's, um, uh, that's how Hollywood works. Yeah, um, and you know she's still she's still uh, kicking slasher ass, uh, you know. Or she was a couple of years ago in Scream Queens, at least. <laughs> yes. Oh, and, and, and Halloween, I suppose this this past year as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, technically, yeah. Yeah, she had another short hair on that. Though. They give her the long hair to make you think of Laurie Strode, and then you one. Yeah, I get why. Hmm. So, um, what was your 40... What is 40? 
Just 40, yeah. Uh, my, my number 40 is Lethal Weapon. Ah, yes. Yeah, which is, you know, great action, buddy cop, comedy stuff in there. Yeah, written by Shane Black, which is a tinge of Christmas. Yeah, yeah. It's it's about the limit. Uh, a lot, you know, it, it's it's like, this is this is the amount of Christmas I can tolerate. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, which, just, is funny, just a bit. which is funny, because I think it's the amount of Christmas that's not enough to call it a Christmas movie. Yeah, I, I can go a little bit further, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But, yeah, you, know, you, you were doing, you're talking about Scrooge earlier. It's like, yeah. no, can't be having that. Yeah. Um, but this is, you know, just a, just a hint. No, no, no. Like, like, oh, like, I'm like not that. saying you can't watch this at Christmas, but for me, this I wouldn't call it a Christmas movie. I, I wouldn't either. But Die Hard is a Christmas movie, just for the record. D- Die Hard is a Christmas movie. That That's probably, in terms of just outright Christmas movies, mm-hmm. that's my line. <laughs> But this is more a, a more appropriate level of Christmas for me. I think you probably uh, get some Christmas horror movies though, because they're not exactly all good cheer. They're... Yeah, yeah, I could probably get into that. Yeah. But that's very different. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I also thought it was very good. Um, it is. You know, yeah. fantastic performance performances from the two leads. You get Shane Black. Uh, fantastic dialogue. dialogue. Yeah. You know, it's all the witty dialogue is great. You got so. Gary Busey. Of course, the 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 legend himself. That's important. Gary Busey is a big deal. <laughs> Yeah. So no, I can't. I can't argue with that. Uh, my number forty, uh, another one I grew up with. This is Gremlins. Uh, Joe Dante's Gremlins. I love Joe Dante. Uh, it may not be the last Joe Dante film you see on this list. Just a fair warning. Um, so of course it has Dick Miller in it because Dick Miller pops up in all his films. Uh, you have Phoebe Cates. You have Judge Reinhold, and you have the main dude who's only ever done Gremlins one and two. Uh, at least that's what I'm sticking to because I've never seen him in anything else. <laughs> uh, it's your know, small town. It's the you know, again, it's Christmas actually. It's set at Christmas, um, and I like the small town vibe. Everything's covered in the snow, and the Gremlins a Christmas present. Gizmo was a Christmas present, and chaos ensues. It's got fun practical effects. It's actually surprisingly dark in places. That I don't think you notice at certain points, and Joe, you know what's funny is like I don't know when I decided that Santa wasn't real, but I feel like I was watching this before I did, and there's a really dark story in this about how Phoebe Cates learned that Santa wasn't real because her dad died trying to come down the chimney, <laughs> <laughs> pretending to be Santa. This is one I, I I haven't seen since I was a kid, mm. so I don't I don't actually remember all that much. I've got you know yeah the, the main mm. bits right, but moments like that. I wouldn't wouldn't remember at all. Yeah, you got young Corey Feldman in there, uh, not staple of the eighties. You, you got a bunch of stuff. Um, great set pieces. Uh, you know, chaos, hilarity. Um, like it, it's just it, it's it's so much of it's definitely more of a horror movie than the second movie. The second one's like full on just dark comedy. This one's yeah. a little bit more in between, where it's kind of a light hearted horror movie and a dark, a dark comedy at the same time. Kids horror kind of although I, th- I think if you watch it you'd, you'd probably think you know what this is maybe a little bit this is pg-13 like I, I i don't think it's rated that but it feels like if you're going to show it to a kid you're, you're thinking around that age yeah but that's fine for kids horror yeah um I'd give that to a six-year-old <laughs> um, i don't know the santa story might break them i'm just saying they might yeah, break them they'll, they'll be fine and G- gizmo's an 80s icon he's adorable yeah. um Everyone likes to joke about the rules, but they make for a fun movie. So, um, yeah, Gremlins. There you go. What's your number thirty nine? Uh, my thirty nine is Ferris Bueller's Day Off, ah. which is interestingly my out, out of the ones I've seen at least my least favorite John Hughes film. Hmm. So you know you can maybe expect another one or two later. Uh, will not spoil where, but obviously you've already mentioned you know, Breakfast Club, so you know just to, just to say that that's still coming because. Mm-hmm. You're an awful person having it so low. Um, no, th- this one's pretty fun, right? Uh, it, it's a uh, it. It's as classic as these John Hughes movies get. It's probably for most people the one that's up there with Breakfast Club as the one that's usually considered the best. Yeah, uh, those people are wrong, but it's still <laughs> very good, which which shows you just how much I like his movies. No, I, I agree. Be- Breakfast Club's a better movie. I, do you know, I like this movie. I don't, I don't think I've ever fallen in love with it quite the same way that other people seem to. Um, but I, yeah. I, I like the premise though. I love the premise of this movie. I, I love the yeah. this take the day off school and go on a bit of an adventure and learn something about ourselves by the end of it. Like it yeah. sounds, sounds good. I don't know. I didn't watch. It. It's been all, I've only seen it like once. I saw it like once like ten years ago. I should probably rewatch uh, maybe it. Maybe need to watch it again. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do remember finding uh, Mira. I can't remember her name. 
No. The girlfriend. I remember. I know what you're on about. She's quite fetching. She's in Time Cop as well. And she's yes. fetching in that as well. It's understandable. And then Alan Ruck. I liked him. Basically, yeah. Bueller's the worst part of the movie. It's basically what I'm saying. I might agree with that. <laughs> this is another part. one where he's kind of a bit of a dick. I mean, outside the, the te- outside the teacher who in real life ended up being a pedophile. Obviously, that's the actual worst part of the movie now. But Yeah, yeah, but we don't mention that. Don't bring it down. I just say it. It's hard not to think about it when I see him on screen, though. That's fair. Because he, yeah. he popped up on an episode of Tales from the Crypt that me and Tim did. Oh, really? And it was like, oh, okay, we have to start with a really bad shit before we talk about the episode because it's uh, it's just as awkward. Sucks. and Yeah. You know. Um... My number 39 is is one that we, you heard us talk about not too long ago, actually. This is Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Hmm. And obviously for many people, this is their favourite Star Trek movie. I, I did not necessarily fall in that side of thinking, but it's obviously one of the better ones. It is very, very good. It has the, 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 the emotional weight as the darker side of the story, and it has uh, the, the emotional ending, of course, uh, with one of the best speeches a funeral ever. I'll, I won't go any further on that, just in case you just somehow don't know what happens in Wrath of Khan, but uh, it's a sequel to a specific episode of the show, which I thought was a, a fantastic idea for, for a movie, to say, hey, that episode was really good, let's do a sequel to that as a movie. And and to make it work that even if you haven't seen that yeah. episode, which, let's be honest, more people have seen this movie than have seen that episode. Absolutely. And I, that's it, though. Like, like with all the movies, including the bad ones, they work even better if you have the attachment to the characters through the original show. They do. So all, all those beats land really well. Because uh, when I watched this the first time without having seen the show, I liked it but didn't love it. I liked it a lot more once I'd watched it again this year after having seen it. Yeah, the... it jumped up having yeah. had the, the context, right? So, no, Wrath of Khan, very, very good. So, um... And it is well known that I love the motion picture, but that was the 70s, so that was not eligible for this list. <laughs> Just for it's a the shame, record. isn't it? Just for the record, because I do love motion picture. But hey, yeah. uh, what's your 38? Uh, 38, what's that? Ah, Raising Arizona. So uh, ah. one that we covered on in Flux. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, one that someone in the live stream may have given you some shit for recently because you completely forgot you'd watched it. No, I just mixed up the title with something else. That was all it was. Yeah, 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 sure. My, my head went to Miller's Crossing for some reason, but mm, yeah, that's yeah, all it was. Because that sounds remotely like Raising Arizona. Shut up. Um, no, this, <laughs> this, was, this was good. This was a good movie. Yeah, this was, this was a lot of fun. Uh, it, it was a blast. You know, if you want all our thoughts, there's a review, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, that's not to like. It's, it's, um, it's probably... Um, ultimately one one on the lower end of, of the the Coen brothers stuff for me it's probably in the middle for me because it's in the lower end of the ones that i like but there's, there's yeah there's, there's a batch that i don't like at all <laughs> so those that's that's fair but yeah no it's yeah. good it's definitely a later one and typically i don't like the Coen's later movies but this one actually there's there's a couple of them i like the lighter mm-hmm. ones um and this is one of them but it, it kind of just gets ridiculous at the end and that's kind of fun it, it gets so ridiculous that yeah that i really get into it and we, we were saying that the, this the character kind of has to have this this uh arc this lesson by the end otherwise it's kind of hard to because it was fine at the start because the whole plot is that they, they kidnap this baby because they can't have their own kid and it was fine when it was just a wacky comedy but the more the movie went on it was like they kind of need to learn a lesson by the end otherwise this doesn't work and luckily it goes down that path it, it does yeah it, it kind of pays off and it, it works out nicely but it's so ridiculous yeah, the, that it's just gone then yeah, why the, not the, the baker all that stuff <laughs> towards the yeah. end is, is gold um yeah my number what we're we on 13, 38 38 uh, my number 38 i'm racing for impact on this one the Empire Strikes Back. We'll get to it later. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm not saying I'm going to spoil Connor's number one here, but I've got a good feeling. I've got a good feeling. I, I will <laughs> confirm nor deny anything. Um, it's very good. Empire Strikes Back is a very good movie. I actually don't like it as much as the original Star Wars because one of the things that I love most about Star Wars is the characters and them as a team on an adventure, which I think the first one gives me the most of. Uh, the second one takes a look away from the others. Now, we still have Han and Leia together and the story's still pretty good, um, but that's why I kind of like the first one more. Uh, Empire, though, is still very good because it has uh, th- th- this this darker growth for the characters 
Uh, and, it, you know, it, it, it's literally what the title is. The bad guys kind of, you know, come back at the heroes and say, no, 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 it isn't that easy. Yeah. Um, it has some obviously very iconic moments. Um, but, yeah, so, but no, I mean, Han and Leia are my favourite parts of this movie. Uh, look, look with Yoda. Eh, it was okay. But it's probably my least favourite part of the movie. Saving it for later. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> but yeah, I like, I like Londo a lot. Um, that's good stuff. Uh, obviously, everyone loves the the opening Hoth battle and, and that kind of stuff, and it is enjoyable. Is it? I like, how, especially in the the more practical looking effects. It's quite nice. So yeah, you know, you can't fault any of the effects. No. Um. So there you go. Empire Strikes Back at number thirty eight. About where it belongs. So, what's oh, your... You're, you're asking for a bottle to the head, my friend. What's your 37? Uh, my 37 is actually one that you mentioned earlier. This is Chopping Mall. Ah, yeah. Because it's just fun and stupid. And sometimes that's what I want to watch. And if I want to watch that sort of movie, this is an excellent example of that. Joe, you know, I was going to sing a song with Chopping Mall in it there. And what's really bugging me is that I immediately have a tune in my head, but I can't remember what the song is that it's coming from. <laughs> oh, I know what it is. It's um, um, Muse, Time is Running Out. That, that's the tune I've got in my head. Okay. Chopping Mall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the looks are. <laughs> I just wanted to say a song about Chopping Mall because it's that good. Um, it is very good. It does deserve a song. Which, was, which is confirmed by season four of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the only TV show in history to ever reference Chopping Mall. <laughs> And to do it with style. Multiple times, even. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Multiple times. I wonder how many people watch this movie because that show kind of... Someone probably will have done, right? Oh, so at least someone did, yeah. Someone said, what's this shopping mall? And someone had a damn fantastic evening because of it. And it was it was a, it was a relevant reference to the plot as well, which I think <laughs> It was. Really it wasn't just for the sake of it. But yeah, uh, my number 37 is A Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, mm. The original Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, obviously, Robert England as Freddy Krueger is great. It's very inventive. I love a movie with rules. So even though it's doing this fantastical thing, was a guy getting into dreams, the character over the course of the film d- tries to think about, okay, how can I f- combat this? You know, obviously I can try and stay awake, but if I'm not going to stay awake, how, what can I do? And there's a lot of proactive thinking. There's a lot of proactive, let's try and figure out how I can fight this. And then you also have the added element of the parents don't believe her and she has to do this on her own, which is also another thing that makes it work. Because you feel like your hero's been burdened. Like it, It's even more difficult than it should be. And that's part of the fun. And then you've got the dark backstory of what Freddy is. You've got some great kills. You've got all this stuff. Um, it's a exemplary little film. Yeah. I still haven't seen it. Every oh. every uh, you know round Halloween time, I go, oh maybe this year, and I always see that box set for a very reasonable price. You, you do, yeah. And I'm like, oh maybe I should just grab that. Not and, only, not only that, it's a box set at a reasonable price that excludes the remake. It's actually like the best of all worlds. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a very you know very attractive box set in mm. terms of a purchase. For some reason, I just never pull the trigger on it, even though I'm sure there's at least two movies in there I'd enjoy. Yeah, probably three. Three? Okay, cool. Three. For the for the price of it, I would I would for even if I only enjoyed two movies, I'd feel like I got my money's worth. And honestly there's another one that you'll probably like, even though it's a bit more bad, but it's still kinda of fun. And then people go kind of either way on another one. There's, 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 I think there's only two movies in there that are definitely garbage that you're not gonna like. Okay. Fair enough. But you know, that's just, that's just but yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll grab it at some point. There's a classic, classic for a reason. Um. So you know, great score as well. Great main theme. You know. Yeah. Do 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 do. I had to finish the phrase once it started. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't not finishing. Oh, we're it. getting a copyright strike. <laughs> or we would if you were any better. If you were. You know, better. That, that's the beauty of it. I can't sing in tune, so we're It'll not going to get caught. picked up. Yeah. <laughs> Even in court, if someone like manually decides that I'm I'm breaking copyright in court, I think I can argue. <laughs> It's like, come on, no one knew what that was really meant to be. <laughs> Only because I explained it in depth yeah. before I did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, what's your number 36? 36 is, ah, The Little Mermaid. So it's the, the, the first Disney film on here that I think I've mentioned. This was the I 80s? I, b- I believe so. I, I think it was late 80s. I that, think that, I, I'm, no, I mean, I you, check you, you know better than I do. I just assumed this was ancient. <laughs> I'm having to double check because I thought it was uh, 89. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. I, 
I assumed this was like the sixties, but so, no, no. When you said this was eighties, I was like, "Shit, was this early 90s? <laughs> That's fair. Um, um, and because I knew it was around that region. Um, I I think I only saw half of this as a kid. I only ever saw the whole thing. Really? Okay. Um, I, I don't know. Just never appealed to me, I guess, as a kid. I never finished it. It's it's uh, you know not my not my favorite of the Disney films from this era. Um, but I do really like it. Uh, obviously, it's you know the, the the classic story. You know, okay, you know, makes a deal, loses a voice, gets to go up and get legs, and you know, speak with the peoples. Well, not speak, try and communicate with the peoples. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very ob- Disney story. Obviously, greatly improved by the remake that was Siren. Oh, obviously. You know, yes. if you really want to know how thoughts on that one, go check out that <laughs> review. That is a one for the ages. Um, yes. I'm pretty sure actually there was a, a Netflix movie of Little Mermaid, you know, the adaptation of the, the original story. Oh, really? This year or last year, like 2018. Mm. And it looked awful, absolutely atrocious. I never watched it, but I'm pretty sure that was a thing. Okay. This mm. does remind me, though, I've not seen Lure, which was meant to be like an insane horror movie, mermaid thing. Yeah, I've not seen that one either. I, I want to say it was Mexican, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, Fair enough. Yeah, not seen that. <laughs> I can't comment. Yeah, no, it's it's good. Yeah, uh, my number thirty six is going a bit darker. This is not one I grew up with. Nightmare on Elm Street was, for the record, as was Empire. <laughs> Star Trek Two was not. Star Trek Two I watched as an adult first time. Uh, this is back to something I watched for the first time as an adult. This is one that I actually I, did. I buy the Blu-ray of this and just watch it blind. I think I did. Um, and you've seen this. Oh. And I think is this going to be something I've forgotten? <laughs> It might be. It may be something that pops up later. Uh, this is Blowout. This is Brian uh, De Palma's film about uh, John Travolta, who is actually a sound... Uh, what's the correct term here? Uh, he's a Foley artist, essentially. Foley artist, yeah. yeah. S- sound recordist, if, yeah. you, if you wanted to use that term. But he, 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 he goes out and records various sounds that he can possibly use in films and things like that. And while he's out recording, he, he's got this long-range mic, because he's, he's picking up like you know, noises of the trees and the birds and the, you know, the night time sky yeah. kind of thing. And he actually accidentally records a, a, a conversation, uh, possibly even a murder. Yeah. It was just a conversation, yeah, it was a murder as well. Um, that, you know, puts him in the crosshairs of some really bad people. And it becomes this thriller of chasing. Uh, John Lithgow's uh, the villain. Um, there's a whole. It's just. It's a really suspenseful movie. It's really well directed. Some, yeah, the direction is fantastic. Great score. I actually. I, and I love the setup. I love that it's like because I, I feel like how many movies do you watch where the main character is a sound recordist for like a for like a production company? Probably none others ever. Yeah, I like how unique that is, and I like that that's kind of the setup for why he's recording. And... I I like how much it utilizes that in the movie. Hmm. Because it's 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 relevant throughout the whole thing. It's not just like oh this is the setup and then we'll forget about it. Yeah, because he uses his skills to clean up the recording. He does a lot of different things. He, you know, yeah. He uses mics later to like try and like you know help his case and things like that. Yeah, um, it's it, you know him him being the the sound recorder, It's not just a setup. It is yeah. consistent throughout the movie. Which which because movies of this kind often it'll be like oh here's your gimmick to get it going and then it's mm. just okay it's another mystery right. And then you, there's a great chase sequence in like, I guess a train station uh, when Lithgow uh, chasing yeah. him around. Uh, it's very good. It's a very, you know, Brian did, De Palma Did we thriller. do this on Influx? We didn't. We didn't. Uh, it's one we should do at some point. I think we both sure. watched it before we started doing the show. Yeah. Or, or at least I did. You may have watched it just randomly. But afterwards, I mean, I've but... watched it a, w- a while ago now, yeah. so it might have been before we started doing it. Um, it's definitely one we should do, because we've done a few of the Palma films that we've liked uh, from this era. So Yeah, there are some good ones. Yeah, it's funny because I feel like modern De Palma is not very good. So it took me a while to try his old stuff, but it's really good. So <laughs> yeah, the, some of those ones they're classics for a reason. And I feel yeah. like this one is a an overlooked one. Yeah, I, I think I've got the Criterion of this. I think that's why. I, I think that's why I blame bought it because it was Criterion. <laughs> I've got some sort of version of it. Yeah. I don't think it's the Criterion. But uh, now blow out. Uh, what's your thirty five? Thirty five. Ah, another one you mentioned earlier. E. T. Ah, okay. So, you know, a bit higher than you had it. I think uh, still probably for a lot of people would be on the lower end. Yeah, I, I think some people would come out of this list and think that should be in the top 10. But Yeah, uh, I, I mean, clearly, you know, 35, I think perfectly respectable. Nowhere near the top 10, though. Um, hmm. But it's good, right? And, and yeah, this is one that we grew up with. This is one that, you know, it was always kind of there. Uh, I say that, the end stuff, I never watched it on repeat, but it is fantastic. Hmm. I, just, I was just thinking about it now again is... Uh, how kind of distressing the stuff before that was as a kid when they've got him captured in the tent and he's sick and 
Yeah. It's yeah, really definitely. sad. It gets really sad. Yeah. It is. It's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's a great movie. Hmm. So, so good, in fact, that Spielberg used it for his production company. The Amblin yeah. logo is the, the kid in the bike going past them. Why wouldn't you? It's, 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 it's such an iconic visual that, yeah, you show, you show that and everyone knows what, you, what, it, what it is, right? Yeah. Uh, my number 35 is actually related to a film that you brought up already. This is Lethal Weapon 2. Yeah. Because Lethal Weapon 2... I love Lethal Weapon 1, don't get me wrong, but Lethal Weapon 2 for me is the, the high point of the series. I think as much as we lose Gary Busey, we gain Joe Pesci. And Leo Getz is a fantastic character that I love. Um, I love how he interacts with the other two. I love um, his whole shtick is just funny to me. Um, it's one of the things that this series does very well. Even 3 and 4, which are the weaker films by far, they both introduce a new character who sticks around for the next one. I mean, I guess not in 4, technically, because there's not a fifth one, but, you know... But would have done. Yeah, like, Chris Rock come, becomes the character. Uh, Rene Russo becomes the character, the new character in 3. You know, uh, Joe Pesci uh, introducing this, and he sticks around for the rest of the series. He's here, you know, yeah. for 3 and 4. And he's just, he's really entertaining. I, I like the villain better in this. Th- this, of course, gave me... My one of my favorite quotable Don't lines of the entire. You Don't know, do it with the accent. <laughs> Diplomatic community. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> I love it. I love the villains. Uh, Patsy Kensett's in there in a random role. Um, there's a love interest for Mel Gibson. Um, it's, it was brutal in places. It's uh, you know, I, I remember you know the first probably several <laughs> dozen times I saw this taped off TV was heavily edited for violence. I'm not surprised. Yeah. So, you know, is you know when I eventually saw the uncut version when I was a bit older and I got the, the DVD, you know, uh, yeah. I may have even imported the DVD just to make sure I got the uncut version. Um it was it was like, "Whoa, this scene was brutal. I never saw this before. What's going oh, on?" This is awesome. Uh just just yeah. really good. It's a really good movie. I, I think one's great, but I think two actually improves upon it a bit. Um, That's fair. Uh, I I realized it didn't quite make my list, but it is very good. Yeah. No, I like it a lot. Um so do you know what's funny? It's funny that this diplomatic immunity thing came up because I was actually, I was thinking. It's funny that I happened to just bring it up. Yeah, I I was no 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 because because I was thinking about this the other day because I was thinking of like coming up with a catchphrase where I I molded it and it was for a DC Comics podcast because I realised that immunity and continuity were very similar words and I wanted to come up with like a a thing about DC continuity in that voice. You already have an ending catchphrase for that. Not for the ca- ending, just just for like when 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 we start talking about crisis and continuity being wonky. This is because of Young Justice, isn't it? <laughs> Shifting continuity or something like that. I don't know. Oh god! Um, but it was making me laugh. Anyway, that was my thirty-five. What was your thirty-four? My thirty-four is going to make you angry, very angry. Because it's because it shouldn't be here because it's too low. Oh, because it shouldn't be here, especially because because uh, this is here and and Little Weapon Two isn't. Akira. I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. Yeah, yeah. You're a bit angry. You're like, oh. I'm you, not you, angry. I'm you, just... you have just residual hatred. I expect you. I expect decisions like this coming from you. That's fine. Hey, I am not alone in loving this. Movie. It's it's like you know. I just use the phrase that parents use on their kids when they're they're upset with them for something. Yeah. You know, I, you, you to me when it comes to things like this, you like I've had a kid who became a junkie, and that was really upsetting at first. But now I just expect you to relapse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm not alone on this one. Akira's great. Everything, yeah. You know, when it gets to that ending, and it's going down. And it's all, all, all the tensions kicking off. It's fantastic. You got all the stuff on the bikes. The animation is gorgeous. It's absolutely standout. Music's fantastic. I don't understand how you hate this as much as you do. I wouldn't say I hate it. I just thought it was a convoluted mess and therefore did not enjoy it. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, my number 34. Oh. Uh, uh, number 34 is actually a counterpoint to something else you said earlier oh because it is halloween 4 the return of michael myers do you know when you when you said uh, you made a, a comment uh, when i mentioned halloween too and you said oh yeah i may disagree you may disagree with something yes. i went oh I, I bet you disagree with me saying two is the best one of the first uh, of two through four 
I even just two through the rest. <laughs> like it's not even just two through four. Just well, I, I have yeah. I have not seen past four. Until, okay, I've seen you know the twenty eighteen, but you know ah, the, the main one. Um, the only one worth watching a little bit is H two O. The rest, uh. <laughs> probably why I started. You know, I, I I saw those on TV and went, uh, that was enough for tonight. Uh, yes. And then I looked into and went, you know what? I'm all right. I'm leaving it there. No, I love Halloween four. Halloween four is definitely the schlocker eighties version of Halloween. But yeah. I love some of the things that it does. I love that it's a town that remembers what happened and is like, when they find out he's coming, they take it. Because in the first movie, one of the big plot points is that the sheriff's kind of skept- you know, kind of skeptical when Loomis is like, you know, so. oh, this mass killer's coming, he's the devil himself, you need to, you know, take precautions. This time, they take it seriously. The sheriff's like, really, like, you know, he's a, he's a little bit hesitant, he's, he's doubtful, but because of the end of two and, you know, the condition that he's in. But other than that, he takes it seriously. And... Not only that, there's like, you know, people in the town start grabbing shotguns. There's like a, a posse, you know, searching the streets for Michael Myers. And I, I like that. I like how it does that. I actually think it's a very fitting ending if you want to take this as the end of a trilogy. If one, two, four is your trilogy, yeah, this ends it with a great ending that says, you know, something. And don't get me wrong, I think one works on its own as, as, as best. Like, I think you take one as a standalone film, but if you want like a fan fiction expansion, two and four make a great trilogy. I, I know I, I really like four as well. Four, it, it obviously didn't make my list mm. clear because uh, of my comments earlier, but I do really like it. Uh, I I like all those first four to varying degrees. Yeah. Um, um. Yeah. There's complaints. The mask is probably the worst it's been in the first four movies and things like that. But um, I love how it plays with with the the, the, the formula a little bit. Um, yeah, it's a fun movie. Uh, you know, fairly likable characters for the most part, and you know everything else. So. No, I really like Halloween 4. Halloween 4 is great. And the obviously, the music's never been better than the first film, but uh, I do actually kind of like the the weird version that this has. It's got, it's got this kind of... Um, it's, it is more synthetic. It feels a bit more fake. Yeah, it piano. felt like they were, all right, well, let's let's try and play with it a bit now. But yeah. they hadn't got to any of the extremes that you yeah. hear later. Yeah, because the best thing about the new Halloween was by far like John Carpenter playing with his own soundtrack. <laughs> and oh, just yeah. being like, oh, let's do some wacky things and... And, you know, I said in some electric guitar because that's something the original definitely didn't have was electric guitar. Yeah, yeah. no, it's uh, good stuff. But uh, yeah, it's Halloween four. So my number thirty three is uh, another one that we've covered on Influx in the past. Um, that's Inner Space. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um. You 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 hinted earlier. Do you have this on yours? You know, maybe. <laughs> is it nearby? Uh, I I will tell you that it just missed the cut. Just missed um, because okay. I've only seen it once. Because it's a Joe Dante movie, I loved it, it when we watched it. I still love it. Um, I think it's one of these ones where once I see it one or two a few more times, times, yeah, it'll probably rise in my list. But oh, I get that. No, I I had such a fun time with it, and I wasn't really expecting to for some reason. Mm. Like I, I didn't have any reason to think it would be you know not good, but it still surprised me with how much I enjoyed it and how fun it was and how clever. Right? Yeah, because the the premise of it is that um dennis quaid uh is in this experiment where he's like he's like a pilot shrinking down into like you know molecule side into this little ship that can go inside people and stuff yeah but someone steals him uh, there's like like a hit on the lab that's like doing all this stuff and this random guy who's a bit of a neurotic dude it's it's kind of this guy who's always nervous and you know he's he's got all these problems he ends up consuming (laughs) consuming dennis quaid's little ship uh not intentionally of course uh, it, or no, actually, not, it's not consuming. He flies in his ear, if I remember right. It does yeah? But, um, he ends up like, or he gets injected into him, or whatever. Uh, because because remember, one of the scientists is like running and he injects him. Uh, yes, to, to, to secure. Regardless, it. the point is then in this little ship, he is inside the man's body and, and he can talk to him. Yeah, he, him. he talks to him. And he has to get use him to help him, like try and solve the problem. The fact that there's a bad guys running after him. It's this full on mystery thriller thing yeah. with with it played through the through the lens of this comedy angle of okay yeah. there's a miniature man inside his body it is a delightful 80s movie it does everything you want it to do with its premise dennis yeah. quaid's got a love interest who he kind of has to try and like reconcile through this other guy <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> such a great subplot uh this is really good um so no, uh, uh, Aerospace is great. It was on my short list. I had like you know when I when I assembled my my first short list to then sort of whittle it down. I had like sixty five yeah. movies. That was on the sixty five. But yeah, I started with a similar amount. Yeah. So, 
Uh, my number 33, uh, another sequel, also another one I grew up with, uh, as was Halloween 4, just for the record, and Little Wim 2, um, is Back to the Future Part 2. Uh, the sequel, of course, to the first one, and uh, I love what this does, you know, this, this is the one that introduced hoverboards, this is the one that, you know, gave us the future. Because the first one, of course, is about going back to the past and, like, almost breaking history and having to yeah. fix it. This one is about, okay, no, there's some wacky stuff in the future, we get to see the flying cars and everything else, um, which I, I think when I was a kid I probably liked this one more because it had all this futuristic stuff in it. Um, that makes sense. But, yeah, so it, re it really plays with things. What I love about it as well is that it goes back into the timeline of the first movie and, like, doubles down on the original timeline. So we have, like, two versions of characters running around at the same time, both the first movie version and the second movie version. And in the case of Doc Brown, we have the real Doc Brown from 55, and then the current Doc Brown <laughs> running around. Yeah. It's it's delightful. It, it plays with these things. It's, it's sort of thing you can only do in a time travel movie, uh, but it has the heart that Back to the Future does. Um, and I, I think it's one of my, one of my favourite sequels. Uh, some people don't like Back to the Future Part 2 as, as much... Well, it's the sequels in general as much, but I like them a lot, and uh, two I, I like quite a bit, so. Mm, fair enough. There you go. What's your 32? My 32 uh, is The Naked Gun. Ah, yes. Yeah. So, kind of back to, you know, proper comedy here now. Um, Very much a comedy that you don't get anymore, right? I can't think of anything like well, this recently. I mean, Not well, that it was any good. Yeah, all those movies that end with the word movie try to be what Naked Gun was and fail miserably. Yeah, yeah, the do, idea of the, 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 the spoof but kind of really slapstick and, and do, do, do over you know the top. Joe, you know the main thing that's, the, all on just the writing quality, Joe, you know the main thing that separates them. Naked Gun isn't spoofing any one particular movie, it's spoofing it's the tropes. genre as a whole. Yeah, yeah, it's spoofing tropes, it's spoofing what happens in a lot of movies, so it makes it kind of timeless even though it's spoofing all these things. Whereas you watch Scary Movie and it's like, it's screaming I know what you did last summer. And then once that time has passed, you know, that's... What, that's what you got going for it. Whereas, like you say, Naked is doing so many movies. Like I say, it's, it's the genre as a whole, right? That, yeah. That because you've seen these tropes so many times, it works. As long as you've seen movies of the era, I mean, it's arguable that maybe some of the tropes have like died down over the years. So maybe it's not as relevant as it once was, but... As long as you've yeah, seen a selection so. of movies, especially from the time period, I think you know you'll get the jokes. You'll you'll get what they're yeah. making fun of. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's it is stupidly over the top in the best possible way, right? Also, one of my favorite gifts comes from this movie, which is when the fireworks has gone off behind them, and he's ah, like, yeah. uh, "Stand back, people! There's nothing to see here. Please disperse." And there's mm. literally a fireworks show gone behind them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so no, I like that a lot. Um, uh, I love it also during the opening where it's like the, the, the bonnet of the police car. Yes. Um, and just the light and it's like driving through all the places. I love how blatantly that's just a sheet of metal with a light on it that attached to a camera. Yeah, they went, screw it. It doesn't matter, right? It's, it's gold. Uh, yeah. nah, I like Naked Gun as well. Naked Gun's good. Yeah. Um, uh, my number 32 is Evil Dead 2. Uh, ah. the, the wackier sequel that goes apeshit with, with its premise and brings in more of the comedy it has skeleton fights it has chainsaws it has hands that are alive on their own it has all these crazy things it is a delightful romp uh, and a night of insanity it's kind of a weird movie in the sense that it's kind of half a remake <laughs> half a sequel yeah it is very surreal but the, but as a remake it completely changes the tone so it gets mm. away with it yes um so yeah, the first five minutes essentially remake the first movie because they didn't have rights to the footage of the first movie. And then it goes from there. So it, it does still follow on naturally from the first movie. It just changes some things because it, they could. Because they had to anyway, so they figured they might as well make it work with the movie that's happening more. Can't argue with them. Um, so, no. Uh, Evil Dead 2. That'll do. <laughs> What's your 31? Uh, my 31. Oh, this is one I know you like. This is uh, Basil, the Great Mouse Detective. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, the second Disney film I've had on here. Uh, this it's, it's Sherlock Holmes, but he's a mouse. And the villain is voiced by Vincent Price, and he's called Rattican. It's kind of great. And there's a bat with a peg leg. There is. It's, it's a fantastic movie. It's definitely an underrated Disney movie. Oh, absolutely. Um, and overlooked, because I, I don't feel like anyone ever talks about this one uh not uh, especially when you consider the 
you know the, the time period that kind of comes right after this movie you know you've you've got you know, i mentioned little mermaids not that much later you know then you're going into your, your, your lion kings and so on and this one's kind of really just overlooked in in that era damn right it is it's better than all those movies well I mean, it's better than some of them better but... than all of them Bob basil uh my number 31 and a completely different end of the spectrum one that i did grow up with unlike evil dead 2 which i did not is commando <laughs> which arguably maybe i shouldn't have been growing up with this one but i did well yeah i did as well as weird things actually i remember like you know when i got older not even that much i just in my teens uh watching some charmed and then realizing that the daughter <laughs> in commando was Alyssa milano um so it's just one of these funny things when I watch it now. I'm like, oh, that's Alyssa Milano, and you can tell it looks like her. You can, like, yeah. Oh, I I only watched this a few years ago for the first time. Yeah, uh, it's all right. Not not really my sort of movie. I kind of just watched it because I felt like I should. Um, <laughs> but I get why people like it. Pardon me. Um, yeah, no, I love this. This is like such a simple action movie that I love. It's you know, daughter gets kidnapped. Arnold's like, you know, I have to like do something about this. Um, and he's on the run from the bad guys uh, who, who are chasing after him. David E. Kelly's really funny, I think. Um, and he essentially teams up with like a, an unwitting partner who he kind of gets along with this woman who just happens to like witness things and ends up being involved. And it's basically it's gearing up for this insane third act where they they go to like a gun store and he he locks up. He he goes to the island where all the bad guys are. It's an island, you know. It's it's a B movie as it comes. And he puts the you know the, the the war paint on, and he stocks up with multiple machine guns, a rocket launcher, and then goes through like the. I mean, forgive the the word, but the Terminator. He goes through this island, like the Terminator, just mowing down people and ripping off arms and beating people with them. It's delightful. Um, th- th- this is like this the simplest best action movie, <laughs> is that there is. I I can't argue. It's it's. Just... I, I I understand everything you just said. If that appeals to you, you'll love this movie. Yeah, it's delightful. Uh, and, and you know, and the, the chemistry it has with the, the 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 kind of love interest is nice. Um, and I, I always like the opening as well, as, as he's going through the the mountains carrying logs because he's a goddamn tank. Because uh, of course he is. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's, it's delightful. Um, but yeah, uh, that is that is my number thirty one. What's your thirty thirty? My 3030. 3030. 3030 is one you already mentioned. Uh, it's Star Trek 2 Wrath of Khan. Ah, yes. Yeah, we, we talked about that uh, earlier. Like I said, you know, the, the way it works, all the beats, uh, it's kind of great. You know, uh, it's it's not, uh, you know, we both agreed it's not our favorite of the Trek movies. Mm hmm. But um, it's, it's, it's up there. It's definitely in the top handful. Yeah. Um,. I already spoke about it, so moving yeah. swiftly on to my number 30, amusingly enough, is Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. Joe, you know, it's funny, we always have this thing, and this has happened with Tim as well on the Screams lists, is that there's always at least one thing that's either the same number or or back-to-back in the sense that it's just, it's, you know, it's like, because because of the order we speak in, like, it'll be yeah. yours going into mine or mine going into yours or whatever. Um, that's not exactly that, but it's, it's, it's close because it's, it's not a Star Trek movie. Uh, Star Trek IV The Voyage Home is a delightful time travel romp where the crew of the Enterprise end up in present day at the time, 1986, and they have to find whales. <laughs> and it, that's, that's, that's fantastic. That sounds stupid, but it's great. And the I obs- was so trepidatious going mm. into this movie. Now, the observations that are made, the humour that comes out of it, of McCoy seeing medical facilities, of Spock, like, un- trying to understand what swearing is, and there's all these other elements, is great. Even Chekhov has some of his best stuff with the, I am looking for nuclear vessels. <laughs> like, you know. Uh, oh, so I, I said the V there, I shouldn't have done that. Vessels, it's we- nuclear it, vessels. It was, yeah. Yes. Um, like, it's just, it's, it's so much fun, and um it has a heart to it it has it's as you know it's some great stuff for spock and, and kirk um, yeah it was that before we watched it you tell me it's kind of a comedy yeah and it's about saving whales <laughs> i was like no this is gonna be awful I, I was like, what, what, what is this? This isn't what I w- w- want out of Star Trek. Also, oh, how wrong was this? is exactly what I want out of Star Trek. Arguably, this is the fairest the movies are in terms of giving all the crew members at least, you know, some good moments. They all get something. They do, yeah. Um, and that's nice. So, um, 
and you know i i, I like that you know the the, the 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 present day woman who kind of like you know becomes the love interest for kirk um you know they don't do the, the pussy footing around where they try and avoid her, her finding out what it is like she eventually finds out and is in on the plan and ends up yeah, coming yeah. along for the ride uh, i like that it goes full swing on that uh it's it great. definitely commits to to all the stuff with her it does absolutely does uh so there you go star trek 4 what is your number 29 yeah it's gonna be a quick one because uh evil dead 2 <laughs> close only, only just a couple of slots away I know. A few slots, yeah yeah like I said, this is a uh, way more fun than the first one obviously i had the first one down near the bottom uh this this is a blast it's you know it completely just changed the tone of the franchise into probably what it is more recognizably considered to be now yeah, it's just what a TV show was kind of aping, especially with uh, uh, Army of Darkness as well, which, you know, went even more into the comedy, to the point where Army of Darkness is barely a horror movie, if you even yeah, want to try and call it yeah. that. It's, it's definitely a horror comedy at that point, that one. This one is borderline, I would say. Um, yeah. I'd say if someone wanted to call this a horror comedy, I probably wouldn't fight them on it. Um, I wouldn't, just because then I'd lose points on our spreadsheets in, in the October thun. There you go. Um, uh, <laughs> number my number twenty nine is another Joe Dante movie. It is the Burbs. This is Tom Hanks and Corey Feldman's in there. Oh, you can tell us at the end of the eighties because Corey Feldman's like twenty now, <laughs> so he's, 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 he's grown up a bit since uh, yeah, since yeah. Goonies and stuff. Um, but he, this is a movie where these weird neighbors come in the house. It's, it's a cul de sac. A little, you know, you know, the Burbs. It's suburbs and little tight-knit community all the neighbors seem to know each other and you know one of these old neighbors is his best friend and they're convinced that these new neighbors are shady that they might be killing people or something so it becomes this this light-hearted jovial movie about them trying to investigate their neighbors and it keeps playing with the idea that maybe there isn't actually anything weird going on so everyone else starts to look at them as if they're being like as if they're bullying the new neighbors obviously essentially because they're yeah because they won't leave them alone um it is great. It is great. It's it's like I, I watched this for the first time a few years ago. Uh, I got the Blu-ray, watched it blind because it was Joe Dante. I took the risk. Yeah, I see this Blu-ray all the time, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, maybe I'll pick that up. And then again, it's one of those that for some reason I never have, but it's always on the the list of oh, it's great. someday. Annoyingly, this has been up for vote and overload like twice now, and it's lost both times. It's happening on Influx at some point. I'm talking about this movie, damn it! It's happening. <laughs> well eventually we're taking it out of the out of the patron's hands it's happening so oh this he's finally going full dictator shut up uh what is your number 28 uh my 28 is ah full metal jacket mm, yes very much a film of two halves and one half is better than the other yes the first half yes the first half yeah i think the second half is still very good so, you know otherwise it wouldn't be this high on the list but if that second half could live up to the first half, oh boy, this would be a lot higher. Because mm. the uh, the first half of Boot Camp at this movie is just phenomenal. Uh, it's probably, in, in, in terms of war movies, I'm usually not a big fan. This is one of my highest ranked war movies in general, I would say. And a large part of that is down to the first half not being at the war. <laughs> Yeah, I think the biggest thing is probably it's directed by Stanley Kubrick. Is, is, yeah. is the big thing, because uh, he he also obviously this is not the eighties, this is the fifties, but he had Passive Glory, which is about these men who are who are being tried for cowardice because of what happens at the start of the movie, and Kirk Douglas kind of has to try and defend them because he doesn't believe that's what it was. Yeah. Um, and so it's essentially a war movie, but it's more of a courtroom movie than it is anything else. Yeah. Uh, but that, that one's really good if you haven't seen it. it it's almost like it wasn't that interested in making a war movie and then he got halfway through this one and went oh go on then because <laughs> that's how movies work they, they make it up as they go along and yeah. then decide halfway through we're well, going to change if, it. if anyone can get away with it yeah it was kubrick yeah uh, this is one that didn't make my list it was on the short list i like it quite a bit but it's definitely on the lower end of my kubrick movies that's fair but uh yeah uh my number 28 is I'm actually returning to a franchise that I've brought up already, um, and that is An Eight Million on Elm Street Part 3, The Dream Warriors, uh, which is my favourite Eight Million on Elm Street movie. This is... I talked about how in the first movie the character gets proactive and like starts forming plans to take on Freddy. This is the natural evolution of that, where you've got, like, you know, at this point, Freddy's legend is spread. We've got, like, five or six kids who are in the, the hospital who, obviously, no one believes them what's happening. They think that, you know, that they're all mentally ill 
but the character from the first movie becomes a psychiatrist and tries to help them and one of the girls has this power where she can actually pull people into her dreams if someone else is sleeping she can pull someone in and this becomes kind of the crux of the movie where it's about fighting back it's about if we can pull each other into our dreams and work as a team then what can we do and it also plays with the idea well these are dreams can we not like manipulate them as well do you know, crazy if, shit if we're in a dream can we not fight back can we not like you know give ourselves our own powers or our own things or, or whatever um for example as a character who's in a wheelchair but once they're in the dream he can walk you can get up and you know do stuff Should bloody hope so if you, if you don't dream of that then you're doing it wrong um i don't know maybe you're healthy if you're not dreaming about that <laughs> on, on a on a regular basis but it's not been on a regular basis but sure. i mean probably at some point right so i love all that it also again much like uh, halloween 4 this to me feels like it's kind of the end of the story if you want to like, end it here because it's not necessarily worth going forward with a lot of the other stuff um because four is not bad and obviously seven's like a weird like meta thing that's outside of continuity so that doesn't matter if it's you know watched right. after us or not um but this this is a neat ending it kind of like goes back to the origins of freddy where he came from and like I don't know if it's a spoiler to say that they defeat him at the end of the movie, um, but obviously the fourth one has to ruin that by bringing him back. Because because yeah. there had to be a fourth movie. Yes. Because money. So, but if you want to accept this as the ending, it feels the most tied into the first one. You can even have to watch two. Two is like a very separate movie. You can just watch one and three as a twofer, and it's this complete story. Mm. Cool. And it's great. Uh, I always hear great things about this movie. Yeah. No, I love it. It's my favourite one. Uh, what's your number 27? 27. Ah. Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior. Ah, yes, yes, yes. This is, uh, this is uh, you know, a, a great movie. It's comfortably the, the the best of the original movies. I'd have to really think about it if I'm included in Fury Road. It's more of a fight, then. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure where I'm going to come down on that one. That's, uh, that's a debate for another day. Yeah, you don't have to for this. This is yeah. the 80s, so... <laughs> exactly. But I've just thought, you know, well, you know, I'm not going to talk about that for a while now. So, yeah, mm. I thought I'd mention it. Um, no, this is great, isn't it? This is because the first Mad Max is pretty good, uh, but it's very straightforward. It's kind of toned down, and this one kind of went screw it, mutant people, everything, just all that, sorts. Yeah, this is the movie that inspired every post-apocalyptic story ever afterwards. <laughs> yeah, pretty much because the first one is is so grounded in comparison, right? Mm. Uh, it's it, it's feels like a it could have been an entirely different franchise uh, uh, yeah. this one is is taking your idea in a new direction to I, have the to, I have to watch the first one again i don't remember liking it that much um i quite liked it it's, it's really quite it's it's quite uh slow and methodical mm. really um and it doesn't have any of the extreme elements that, that, that the second one introduces yeah two is just a good action movie. there's great car chases there's great ideas about them worshipping uh you know fuel because there's not a lot of it because it's the post-apocalypse yeah. um so they're, they're protecting this oil tanker that's full of oil so, some great side characters that are just mm. just here you know you know they're not big big deals but they're, they're all everyone there has a, such a personality and it, kind of, and it kind of establishes what we think of as mad max being because it's mad max as the reluctant hero who kind of comes in and ends up into the fight even Can't, though he doesn't it, want yeah, to yeah even when he's not even trying he just kind of ends up there yeah and i love how it plays with the idea that he's only got like like one shotgun shell or something like that you know he starts off with no yeah, ammo. yeah. The, the gun's just for show more than anything else. Yeah, it, it, it's playing with that throughout the whole movie, mm. that, that shell. Um, so, yeah. Uh, no, I can't argue with that. Uh, my number 27, I'm going back to Brian De, Brian De Palma uh, with Body Double. This is one that we did early on in Flux. Uh, yeah. Fantastic thriller. Uh, it's very stylish. Lots of music. There's f wonderful direction and camera shots. Um, there's one particular shot I'm thinking of in my head right now where... It's this like sort of beachfront kind of like set of apartments, yep. and it's it, and they're, they're they're kind of like kind of stair formation where they, they keep going, you know, because it's going up a hill, so yeah. each level's got like one step back. If if a giant was walking down it, it'd be a nice set of stairs for him. <laughs> um, yep. But there's this shot where you just look at that from the front, and there's like a, there's giant staircases on either side of this this apartment complex, and you can see characters coming down one side and up the other side, and it's this it's, it's, it's game of cat and mouse, and you can just see it all. It's it's glorious. It's oozing in style. It's a little bit sleazy because Brian De Palma does sleazy. But it's sleazy in a way that works in the tone of the movie. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it's a great thriller. I, I, I love Body Double. This was a nice surprise oh. for us when we watched that. Yeah, yeah. Because we weren't, again, this was, we, we're like, well, we like some of these De Palma films of this era, but mm. 
are we going to like this one? And and we we definitely did. Right? Yeah, that's shot up near the top for me. Um, yeah. I, I, I think, you know, uh, you know, I like this more than Untouchables. I like this more than, you know, I've seen some of his 70s movies. I'm sure we'll get to them at some point. Um, yeah, probably. But this, yeah, this may be my favourite De Palma film. I've not really thought about it, but it may be. No, that's fair. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to just, just swing in because 26 is, uh, is Blowout. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but obviously we, we spoke about it quite a bit earlier, but uh, De Palma back to back. Yes, but De Palma back to back. Yes. Um. Yeah, Ok, well, that takes out my 26, which is actually the last entry of the episode. Uh, this is the end of part one. Uh, my number 26 is one that you've actually mentioned. Oh. It is Basil, the Great Mouse Detective. Yeah, I didn't want to go too in-depth on it, because I know how much mm-hmm. you, you do love this movie. I wanted oh, to let you go on about it. I love it so much. Um, the investigating, the idea that... Because what I love about it, it's not just that he's, he's, a, he's a Sherlock, but a mouse. The real Sherlock in that still exists. Like they live in the world with the humans, and yeah. it's like it's like a secret society that exists down, you know, down at foot level, basically. Yeah. Um, and they have like you know the the mouse doors in the wall, and like they have the dog that helps some Sherlock's dogs, like the transport and all mm. that stuff. And uh, Rattican's fantastic. The, I love how scary it generally gets at the end because the, one of the first ever examples of CGI in a film is the clock tower clock fight tower, which yeah. is gorgeously rendered and it's 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 basil and ratican having this this again this game of cat and mouse pardon the pun uh on these gears as they're spinning and there's like almost deaths like left and right and it feels very dire at point also the music's very good i love the main team I, you know mm. I, I hadn't seen this in years um you know maybe about five six years ago i hadn't seen it in like you know probably 10 years at that point maybe longer and the blu-ray came out and i bought the blu-ray because i was like yes yeah and I, I put it in, and as soon as the music started playing at the title screen, I got giddy because I, just, I got this wave of nostalgia. Because this it is, is one so I, good. Yeah. I watched this so much as a kid. Yeah, this, this is one I never saw when I was younger. This is one yeah. I watched in the past, you know, five, seven years. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, probably, you know, not long after the Blu-ray came out. Probably so. Very similar time to you when you last saw it. And I thought, you know, I, I got a lot. I've got most of the Disney Blu-rays, uh, not all, but you know, I was picking them up, and. Uh, so I got this one, having not seen it. Uh, and the reason I've got most of them, even though I hadn't seen some of them, is because they're all numbered. The bastards. Yes. Um, yeah, the, it's the, great. The plot, yeah, the plot of this one is that a uh, little girl, her dad, the inventor, gets kidnapped by Ratkin because Ratkin wants him to build, you know, a contraption. Um, yeah. Evil stuff. Yeah, and the little girl comes to comes to comes to Basil for for help. And I love the scene where she tries to like get him on the job, and he's like, "Nah, I don't have time for this. This is his, you know." And his uh, because there's a character who kind of becomes his Watson, but he's not actually with him. He actually yeah. comes with the girl. He helps the girl come and find him. And uh, it's when she says Ratican, you know, or she mentions the bat with the peg leg, and he's like, and "It's he gets, Ratican." He, yeah, he perks yeah. up. That's his Moriarty, and he's like, "Yes, okay, I have to find him." Um, I love that. I love that he's got like a lab and it's like all the test tubes and beakers and all the, the crazy shenanigans. All, all this stuff uh, is great. So, um, no. Uh, Basil, great mouse detective. I love it. Uh, so that actually wraps up the first half of, of our countdown. Yeah. So, things to note. Mm-hmm. You had Empire hideously <laughs> low. Yes. And that also means that you presumably do not have Return of the Jedi anywhere. No, it's, it's not deserving of being on the top 50 of the 80s. You're an awful person. It's okay, but it's not that good. We're done here. <laughs> There's not going to be a second part. I can't, I can't continue working with this. Did you honestly think Return of the Jedi had a chance of being on my top 50? I mean, maybe at the, like, 50 to 48 range. <laughs> That's a really narrow range. It was a really narrow range. It's very specific, wasn't it? It wasn't even on my shortlist. I never even considered it. God, you're the bloody worst. I knew I didn't like it that much, enough to put it on here. I mean, I think I like it. I mean, it's enjoyable, but it's not. It's not in my top fifty. I'm sorry, it just isn't. I, I can't say anything else about it. It's, but it's, I mean, when you bring it up, because I know you're going to. Um, I'll, oh, it's I'll, coming. I'll voice my grievances. Yeah, and I will tell you why you're wrong on all of them. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So. Uh, that does wrap up part one of this countdown there. Part two will be coming next week. Um, maybe it'll be a week later than we intended on it just because of delays and internet outage and other things. But uh, regardless, we're here now. And this was part one of your top 50 of the 80s. Yeah, we have many a movie coming. We do, we do. We've actually recorded a couple of episodes in advance for March because we're planning a kind of a special month in March. 
based yeah. around a certain uh, birthday and anniversary. That, that I'm pretty sure you've said publicly multiple times, I have. so I don't know why you're being so coy about it. Okay, it's Batman's 80th birthday and his 1,000th issue of Detective Comics, so... Yeah, yeah, well, it's, so, not his, uh, it's not his with 1000s. He didn't show up until 27, so technically it's his 960 or 73 <laughs> issues. Whatever. The point is, yeah. uh, yeah. Detective 1000, it's Batman month. So it's yeah, a lot of so Batman obviously, uh, we, we Right back at the start of this video, I brought up Batman, right? <laughs> so you can hear a discussion on Batman. Yeah, it's it coming. We've um, already recorded it. Admittedly, patrons, because they get things a week early, they'll actually start getting Batman movies uh, in the last week of February, but um, it'll be March for uh, everyone else yeah. throughout. You get Batman movies. Uh, so look forward to that. Um, uh, the news shows are coming back. Um, in fact, by the time this goes up uh, on Patreon, the first TV news should be like the day or two after, so we should have the news back for 2019 kind of hitting there. Yeah. Um, and then apart from that, anything to tell you about? So, yeah, there's, there, there should be some upcoming extra movies where we do some catch-up movies mm. for in, in the awards season yeah that's true yeah we'll be doing we've got some... some stuff tentatively scheduled uh that we're hoping to get to yes very tentatively <laughs> yeah yeah i'm not going to say anything because things can change but mm. we definitely have some that we're like no we want to cover that that's getting some buzz we're interested yeah yeah uh, so <laughs> yeah that, that is that is the that is the plan so uh let us know what you thought of the of our picks and by all means give us your uh lists in the comments below um if you want to wait till the, the, the you know part two so you can do the whole 50 in one go uh, fair enough but if you want to give us uh, 50 through 26 just now we, we like seeing them uh so by all means give us give us them give us them on uh but yeah so we'll see you for part two uh you can like and subscribe all the usual things because it does help us out a lot if you do that uh, even more so if you go to patreon.com slash mail tv and you can you can uh, sign up there and uh, give us a dollar once per month or even more if you want to. Um, we appreciate that loads, of course. Uh, but otherwise, that is us. So get us on Twitter at mailed underscore fuzz. And we'll see you next time. So thank you once again for watching and listening. We always appreciate it. Keep watching movies, guys. And we will see you next time.